Uh, so, Henry, will you uh, offer our opening prayer when we... Okay. Uh, of course, we got our normal. We Philip has, of course, came home, and so uh, I guess he's doing well enough to at least be at home. Uh, we need to continue to remember Philip and Gwen. Um, yeah, he's yes, that's right. He is in rehab. He's I good. Well, I said he's doing good in his sleep, and I went to visit him yesterday. Yeah, that's right. He is in rehab. See, that's where you, mentally, you know, you you depending on your mental status to take care of you, and that don't always work out real well. Uh, we get um, Richard, of course, had his surgery on his hand on his hand for cancer and stuff, and he's doing good, or I guess he was doing good. I don't see him today, so. Said he was when I talked to him. But when I saw him talk to him Thursday, he was. He was doing pretty good. Um, then, of course, Rick. Rick was sick Thursday night at Summer Manor. He didn't feel good at all, so he wasn't there, and that's unusual for him not to not to come down and meet with the group. Um, so we need to continue to remember Rick in our prayer. And then uh, Amy Chandler, need to continue to remember her. That's... Uh, his daughter-in-law, right? And then, uh, of course, his son, Chris, and uh, Carolyn. Uh, how is she doing? She's not doing real good. Yeah, I know she wasn't, she wasn't feeling well at all. A little bit. This, this last treatment and stuff <coughs> has done a number on her, and and having, of course, having to be real careful too, not to catch nothing from somebody. They, they are. They, when you talk about the last treatment, you're talking about the last chemotherapy or radiation. Yeah. Well, they did. I don't. I think they're through with the chemo, ain't they? Yeah. They, they she's on a, still yeah. on radiation. This. Uh, she done had the first this new treatment. I had. When I talked to her the other day, she was she was talking about. Gonna try something new, something that hopefully wouldn't be as rough on her as that chemo was. Yeah, I, I hope not, because she's had a tough time with that stuff. I want to continue to remember her. Continue to remember Beverly. Of course, she can't have her MRI until uh, August the sixth, and that's, I mean, for me, that's just so ridiculous that she's been to the doctor about two weeks ago, and then. They've ordered their MRI. In fact, they've ordered three for her neck and her back and stuff. And because she has a defibrillator, they had to turn that defibrillator off before they can run an MRI. Well, they only do that once a week. And uh, so why, I have no earthly idea. I, I don't understand that. You put a machine up there to it, you turn it off, and you, gets through, you turn it back on. You'd think somebody could be there every day to do that, but, you know, I don't run a hospital, so. At least Emily Patrick, is, she fell and cracked her, her neck. <coughs> On the inside, it's, it's uh, uh, the bone, it's, it didn't separate, didn't get off out of, out of line. So mm. they didn't, they decided not to do no surgery neck brace and she's got to wear that for several weeks. Miss Emily, uh, if you didn't hear that, she fell and <laughs> did I get broke a neck or yeah. kind of broke her neck, but she doesn't it's not to the point where she they're gonna have to do surgery. They're gonna they're able to just be able to uh, put a soft brace on it. More a fractured part. Mm -hmm. Not not the whole thing but fractured yeah, okay. in, in her front. Like, you know, she fell just hit got on Bad, bad looking spot up on her head that got mm. up here. Fell on the concrete. And uh, mm. carried her down at the hospital down in the new hospital there in Florence, in the North Alabama. I think the name of it. Mm. It's where Charles was. And uh, they kept her several hours running tests and then they brought her back home. Uh, 
Uh, has anybody else got anything? Sounds like, a, I mean, our list looks like it's, <laughs> seems like it's growing. Um, I want to continue to remember Mark and them while they're on their trips and, and, and uh, going to Missouri. And I think they're coming back, and then I think they're going camping. I'm not positive about that, but I think they are. Um, anybody else got anything that we need to mention? Okay, Brother Henry. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning, Father, ready to worship you. We pray in spirit and in truth. And we pray that everything said and done will be in accordance with your will. And Father, we want to mention, not by name, because my memory's not that well, you know that. And Father, all those that have been mentioned, we pray your blessings upon them, that they might be restored back to their health. Father, we <coughs> ask you that we might be able to help them as best we can to visit those who are able to have visited fathers, but not don't don't bother those who are not supposed to have visits. But remember them in our prayers and and a telephone call occasionally would help. Father, we ask that you would be with us this morning as we uh, worship you. We pray pray that, again that we might do so in spirit and in truth. And Father, pray that uh, we would get gain much from it. And, Help us to take it home and live it out with us in our everyday lives. Father, we pray for the leaders of our country. We know that things, Father, are going in the wrong direction. And, Father, trying, trying to change everything from the once free nation that we had, Father, we pray that, that uh, in this upcoming election that somebody might be put in office that, that loves our country and wants things to remain uh, as it used to be, Father, a free, free nation where everybody can enjoy the freedoms that we have always enjoyed. Father, help us through this service, again, to, to pay attention to those things that are said and to be doers of your word, not just hearers only. Forgive us of our sins, and your will be done in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Henry. Okay. Uh, Thank you. We got past James chapter 1, verse 6, but I'm just going to mention that just for a second, that verse, but let him ask in faith with no doubt, and for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. I just wanted to go back there because the next verse just says, uh, when you go to verse 7, it just says, for let not that man. So we want to know who that man is. and That man is a doubting man. That man is a man that doesn't, he's not asking in faith. He's not having that confidence in God that he can answer his prayers. And so you want to you be able to uh, not doubt. And he, they, he had a problem of doubting. And if you've got a doubt and you're wavering back and forth and you're up and down and you're all over the place and you're not constant in your living, and James says don't expect that man to receive anything from the Lord. He, and you shouldn't. Nobody should expect that. If you're wishy -wash, that wishy-washy, then you really shouldn't even expect that the Lord's going to give you anything and answer your prayers. And so that's kind of where we, we went through that. And then he's further described in verse 8 as what? He's a double-minded man, and he's unstable in all of his ways. That double-minded is dipsychos. And dipsychos is... It's translated like double-minded, or it could be two-souled, which means they got two-souled as they're in two different places. You know, they're not they're not totally single-minded. They're they're all over the place, and it's even scary because it, this is, sounds like a science fiction movie or something. They're even two-headed. It means that too. So. You know, that's not somebody you want to <laughs> kind of be around that's always two-headed, two-souled, uh, two double-minded. Uh, it's kind of like, almost like somebody that's been drinking too much and they're staggering all over the place. That's kind of what their mind is like. They're not focused. They're not single-minded. They're double-minded, and they're just here and there. And like you said, they're kind of like the ways 
there's nothing to stabilize a wave. I mean, they don't have legs or anything, or they don't have anything to anchor themselves down. So when the wind blows, they just the wave just goes whichever way the waves the waves just goes whichever the waves the wind is blowing. And you, you watch that bobbler. You know when you used to when I used to bank fish some. I'd sit there and I'd have that bobber. Sometimes I couldn't tell whether the fish just took it under or, or not because it would go and get behind them waves and stuff and get over in that rough part. And I'm like, is it under? Did the fish get it or no, nah, it's just a wave. And that's kind of what uh, this person is like. They're up, they're down, they're sideways, they're, they're everywhere because they're depending. It just depends on which way the wind is blowing. It's which way they are. So this double-minded man, and he's unstable in all of his ways. He's, he's uncertain. Uh, he's, uh, he doesn't know the truth about everything. He's uncertain about the truth of, of something. He's doubting. He's hesitating. And the only ever other place that this word is used in the whole New Testament, that this particular word, guess where it's at? James, and it's in chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you, uh, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And that's the only other place that, it, that this form of this word is used. And isn't it weird? One of them is James 1, 8, and the other is James 4, 8. That, that it is. So it's kind of easy to remember that part of it. If, uh, if you were thinking about a person in the, in the Bible that might fit this category, who would you come up with? Who would maybe be the first person you would think of? Thomas? He was doubting, that's for sure. This double-minded person, who do you think, who else do you think that you might come up with if you were thinking about a double-minded person? Yeah, he, he wrestled with definitely had that problem with physical and spiritual battling each other. Peter, that's, there's, there's no wrong answer to this. Judas, mine, the, to me the almost the perfect example of this is, is somebody that's going this way, but they still wanting to hold on to this. And basically that double-minded person is somebody that's what I used to describe as one of the most miserable person in the world is somebody who has so much Christianity in them that they can't enjoy the world, but they got so much world in them that they can't enjoy Christianity. That's a miserable person. I can, I can tell you for sure that is a miserable person because the reason why I know that is because I've been there. Before I wanted to try to hang on to Christianity, and I loved Christianity, but that world just kind of was dragging me and wanting me to, to be a part of it. And at the same time, if you got out into that world a little bit, you felt terrible, you felt guilty, so now you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm such a terrible person. And then you get, before you're back into Christianity, and then you feel so guilty there, then now you're back in the it was a back and forth thing, and it was awful. It's terrible. You do not feel good about that. It's a terrible feeling. But if you think about a person that had that kind of mentality and it did that, would, what about Lot's wife? Would she be a really good example? They don't look back. What'd she do? She looked back, and when she looked back, what happened? Turned to a pillar of salt. She, she just couldn't leave that world behind. And, and God said, don't, don't look back. And she, she's, I'm sure if she, with all her might, she's trying not to, but she just had too much of that life behind her that she didn't look back. And that's found in Genesis 19 and verse 26. But while his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So to me, that's kind of like a perfect example of a, of a double-minded person. What's a single-minded person? When you think of a single-minded person, what is that? Who is, 
Not who, but what is that? Where's their focus? Right. They, they love the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, and then they solely, totally depend upon God. That's the single-minded person. And so you can see what a contrast that is between that person and this double-minded person that's expecting God maybe to give him something. And the, to me, the remarkable part about it is if somebody tells me, and, and you know that they're going to keep their word, somebody tells me, ask for it, and it's yours. And not only can you ask for it, but I'm going to give it to you generously. And not only am I going to give it to you generously, I'm not going to put you down when you ask for it. He's already told them that. If you lack wisdom, ask God, because he will give it to you generously, liberally. And, and then he's, he's saying not only that, but I'm going, when I give it to you, I'm not going to make fun of you. You know how sometimes as parents, the kids come ask us and you said, man, I just gave you $10 the other day. What did you do with that? And they got something always <laughs> that you get, you know, they're coming back to and they're kind of scolding you for it and they make you feel guilty for it and all this kind of good stuff. God said, I'm not going to do that. And actually in the Greek it says, "Act, ask re repeatedly. Ask several times. Ask as many times as you need to carry this out. And for it to be, you know, to you get the wisdom that you need so that you can pass this test that you're going through so that I can get you where I want you to be. I want you here. You're here. So if I'm going to get, if I want you here, that's what these tests are for. That's why you're going through these hardships and things. Go through them. And let God get, let him do his work. And when you let this do its work, that's what you're going to achieve. But if you're a double-minded person, and you don't know for sure if God's going to do this, what he said he was going to do, and you have doubts about it and things like that, why should you get it? You need to ask with confidence because I, and when God tells you he's going to give you something, you can take it to the bank. He's going to give it to you. Now, some other people, you know, in the life, you know, that might not be the case. But when God says it, you can carry that to the bank. That, that's, it is going to happen. And so in this double-minded man, he said every single thing that he goes through is the same. I mean, he's unstable in all his ways. Not just in his prayer life. He has an inconsistent Christian life and you know, all this time, what's supposed to happen was these trials and these hardships and things was supposed to build your faith. It's supposed to build your endurance. But what's happened to this guy? His, he don't have the faith he ought to have. It, it's not working. And he ought to be asking for the wisdom, but he's asking it without faith, and he's asking it with double-mindedness not expecting God to give him what, it, what he's asking for. And when you look at James here, when it comes to this, there, there's no middle ground. Do you have faith? Or if you don't, if you, you either have the faith or you don't. You either trust God or you don't. It's not, not any middle ground there for him. Okay, let's go to the next section. Anybody got any comments? No questions, because I probably don't know the answer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. In James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, this part, to me, is testing that it comes to the rich and poor alike. If you, if you think that you're rich and you're going to get by and there's not going to be any tests, guess what? If, you think, if you're poor and you think you're not going to go through any kind of testing and troubles and heartaches and pains and different things like that, guess what? You are, and you will. And yeah, and it, very, very much so. Uh, in in verse, chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. We're going we're gonna to deal just with that one first. 
He says, some, some, well, some believe here that James is changing the subject, that he's not no longer dealing with trials. I don't think so. <laughs> he hasn't changed any of his, you know, even if you go down to even verse 12, when you pass to the black part of this, it's talking about trials, and the trials and what they just went through. So I don't, and he's talked about the trials in the first eight, you know, second through eight verses, so I don't believe in just in the middle of the road he all of a sudden just changed his direction. I believe that uh, he's dealing with the poor and what their trials and tribulations and stuff, and I also believe he deals with the rich and their trials and, and tribulations. Um, he starts out by saying, let the lowly brother, and the important thing there is he says brother, and the Greek word is aldelphos, and so that could be brother or sister, but in this particular, you know, no matter who it is, this is a, a Christian brother or sister that's going through this. And he's, then he's telling that, first of all, you're dealing with a Christian, and this is a Christian brother or sister. And then he says, the word is tapanos. That's the Greek word for it. That, that he's a lowly brother or a humble brother or he's undistinguished brother. He's a poor brother. He's a downcast brother. He's a uh, subservient uh, brother. And that's the definition when he says he's a lowly brother, he, he's nobody, basically is what the, the word is saying, that Tapanos is saying there. But what, what does God tell him there? And what, does, what do we hear there? Let the lowly brother what? Glory, rejoice. Uh, He's, Ronnie, he's just saying he, he's humble in the way that he lives his life. It doesn't mean he's a bad person or, you know, something like that or not worth anything. God says that he, he just lives his life in a humble way, which is what we're all supposed to do. Yes, and that, that's, that's also a possibility. He's probably a poor person, but well, yeah. humbly, humbly here, you know, could just be his lifestyle. He's, he's just a humble person. And... I think I'll bring this up in, in when we talk about the rich person, but um, because when you get to the, the rich person, that same word is used. Tapanos is used. A little, little different form, but it's the same form of that word. Totally different meaning, nearly. So, and I'll, I'll tie that in a minute so I don't want to get a. <laughs> I, I get ahead of myself sometimes in my thinking and think, well, I need, do I go ahead and tie it together? But I won't right now. I'll wait, I'll wait a little bit. But this, this brother that was this Tapanos brother, and as we talked about and where his, where his state is, despite that position, despite, despite where he's at, what does it tell him there that he is to what? To, to glory. That word glory is kakaoe, and that's easy for you to say, but this is actually one time where it's all, all right to brag. That's basically what this is saying. You can take pride they, in something, it's to boast, it's to glory, it's to pride oneself, it's to brag off of it. But what is he bragging about? He's not bragging about himself, he's bragging about his what? Let the brother, the lowly brother, glory in his exaltation, in his hoopsas, and that is high position. You're in a high position. You may look undistinguished. You may be look humble. You may look lowly. You may look like all these different uh, characteristics that they put there for that word. Here's where you're at. You're up here. You're in this high level. You're in that hoop sauce. Really high position. And so you need to brag. 
and take pride in yourself that even though you're humble and lowly and undistinguished and all these other character other definitions and words that define you, here's where you're at. Glory in that. And be exalted in the fact that you're up here. That, that, and let, let God have the glory as well because that's what's happening. When you glory by your life and how you live, who ultimately gets the glory for that? If you're the best person at your job, which you should try to be, then even though you may get some recognition, who ultimately gets that? See, that's, that's, that's kind of how this works. Your recognition is God's recognition when you do these things. Yes. Right, you don't get too high because if you get too high, then you're, you're sinning <laughs> again, you're back. But th- this is not rejoicing really so much in himself as he is rejoicing in his position that God has put him in. And his position is not based on what he did. It's based upon what God, you know, how he looked at God, how he viewed God. And that same thing is going to happen to the rich, here and like I said I'll try to tie this together for how I think that these two might fit where the trial might be super trial really kindly um, verse, uh, verses 10 and 11 but the rich in his, uh, in his humiliation because as a flower of the field what does that say after the flower of the field who will pass away Hey. Does it say hey in the King James? He will pass away. So is it the richest passing away? Or is it him that's passing away? For, for no His glory is going to pass away. Huh? The richest glory is going to pass away. Yes. That is, that's definitely going to happen. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, it flower falls, its beautiful appearance of perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in all his pursuits. And now here again, the rich is plosius, and that's rich. That means exactly what it sounds like, rich, wealthy. It means that he's got more earthly possessions and he exceeds what's normal for anybody to have. So he's not like that humble, lowly, poor person. But here's where it gets kind of imp- interesting because taponosis is the word that it's used there to, uh, uh, as well as what it was used in the, in, for the lowly in person. Guess what it means here? An experience of a reversal in fortunes. So I'm thinking, well, that's interesting. So what does that really mean? So was he poor? See, we got to keep remembering. Now, who's this written to? Christians. That are what? They are in the diaspora, right? They're, they're scattered. They're scattered abroad. Sca- the Jewish, right. They're right. Jewish. So they're, we're writing to those as Christians. And what was they running from? Why were they leaving? And this is kind of, you know, where Paul was out there uh, persecuting the church. And so there was persecution going all around so they're running from the persecution that was happening in Jerusalem and they're going all over the place and so here they are now what if <laughs> this person was a poor person when he left Jerusalem and all of a sudden now he's rich and what if that other person was a rich person 
And he's had a reverse of circumstances as well because that's what that tapenos means as far as, as how it applies to the rich man is he's had a experiencing of a reversal in fortunes. So can you imagine the trial you would be going through if you was a rich person and all of a sudden you're poor? Or a trial that all, you're a poor person and all of a sudden you're rich. See, it doesn't matter in that. Both of them was very much of a trial. I mean, that's a big time temptation that's going to go through. Here you were rich, now you're poor. Or here you were poor and now you're rich. And what a transition that is and, and what a trial that is for how you handle that. Now, you, you can see a lot of people when they, if they go from having hardly anything to having a lot or having somebody that goes from having a lot to nothing, man, that, that's, a, that's a trial. And you see how people's lives get ruined all the time because they've gone from nothing to riches really quick and there's no adjustment and they don't know how to handle it. And, uh, and then same thing if you have a lot and you go to poor. How do you, how do you handle that? How do you deal with, with that? I'm not saying that is what's happening from that person that was poor. Might not be. In. I just know that what the Greek here says for the taponosis is that they're experiencing a reversal in fortunes. Yeah. took his life, lost, lost everything he had and he took his life. And I may have been more, more than one, but, but uh, and of course we can go back through history and find out that's happened many, many times. Yeah, and that's, I, I guess what is, you know, what always made me wonder, and it's not money that makes you happy. You know, that people think money's going to make you happy. Well, you can live better the more money you got, you can actually probably live better. But at the same time, that's not cre that doesn't create happiness because if it does, why, how do we explain some of these rock stars that, I mean, made it big. I mean, made it huge. And then all of a sudden, they kill themselves. Why, why are you doing it? You got everything. You know, for the average person out there, you go, well, you got all the women you could want, you got all the money you could want, you can buy whatever you want, so why are you not happy? Because that's not where the happiness is. Happiness is not in the money, and in money itself. Uh, somebody turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. This is a very, very familiar verse. And when you get there, whoever wants to read it gives God a chance to bring you the mic so that they can hear it at home. I know that mic. Wish we had hanging down mics that would control. You want to get it back? Or Larry, you want to get it? You want it? All right. Larry's going to get it. Well, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which have some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced himself through the narrow sorrows. Yeah, so what what is the what is the problem there? Is it money? No, no what's a, the problem? It's the, the love of money, it's your heart. The love the love of money. And the word there is uh filler agoria. And phileo is of course that's one that's kind of like friendship love. So the, here's, here's the love of money. And oftentimes we have this misconception that this just applies to the rich, right? I mean, that's kind of our thinking that the love of money has to apply to the rich because the poor don't have any. So, you know, it does, it's not referring to the poor. Why is that not true? 
What do the poor people do sometimes that shows you they must have love for money? Do they steal? They rob, they steal, they murder, they do things like that. Why? Because they want something that you got. And so they have a love for money. They got a love for things like that. So sometimes it's not just applying to the poor that has a love for money. It applies also, you know, to the rich, but also to the poor. Because you, there's poor people who would do almost anything to get something that somebody else already has. And so, I mean, uh, we, we need to be careful how we apply this, but we also, the meaning of this, love of money, we've got to make sure that we don't have that in our lives, that we don't, that money is not the key to everything, that, that loving God and your standard. And that's a pro- part of the problem the, the deal that's going on here, I don't care if you're rich or poor, you're going to have trials and tribulations and persecutions and hardships and things like that. You're not exempt from these trials and tribulations from a financial status. Yes. Yeah, that's probably the biggest thing. Somebody turn to Matthew 16, 26. Probably never heard this verse before. <laughs> Probably brand new to all of you. Just kidding. <laughs> Who wants to read that so can we don't have to make Scott run? Henry's gonna read it, Scott. What is a man's give if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So, even if, if this verse is mind-boggling to me, if you could have every single thing in the world, everything, it was all yours, where would you still be? What would you do if you lost your soul? Where would you be? What would it matter? Or what would you give in exchange for your soul. Yeah, it's, I mean, how valuable is your soul to you and to each and every one of us? Because that is to the extent is, what will you exchange for it? Will you exchange this having this money for your soul being lost? See, I don't, if we really thought about that and it sunk in, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have the whole world. We wouldn't want the whole world if it meant we were going to lose our soul. Yeah. Regardless of what you have, you are rich. That, that is exactly right. And that's one of these things that I, I thought about the, what come to my mind automatically was the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man had all this wealth and he had all this. He could have handed, what, what would it have been to hand a little bit of food to Lazarus, a beggar? He could have done that without, with ease. It wouldn't have meant nothing to him. It wouldn't have hurt him. But he didn't. He held it back. And then guess what happened when eternity turned around? This beggar all of a sudden becomes a rich person and this rich person begs for somebody just to go and bring it, get the tip of water. Just, just dip your finger and tip your finger and a little bit of water and come and touch my tongue so that I can be I, cooled off a little bit so I won't have to be going through all this torment. He went from a rich man to a beggar and the beggar was sitting there in Abraham's bosom. Man, what a picture. And all he had to do was hand him a little bit of food, help him out a little bit, and he gave up all of that for what? For a begging for a, a, just a dip of water, just put it on his tongue. Second Corinthians... Uh, Somebody turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. 
Well, I was going to pick it up today. I thought I am, I am, I am going to double it. Okay. Second Corinthians four fifteen through eighteen. Yes. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but through our outward, oh, but though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but are things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So where is our focus supposed to be? Or should it be? On things you can what? Can't see it, can you? You can't see, you can't really just say, I see heaven. I see God. You can't just look up there and there it is. Now you can look around you and see God, but you can't just look up there and say, okay, there's heaven and there's God. You can't do that. But if you can say, I know heaven's there and I know God is there and that's where I'm going to put my focus because if you put it on things that you can see, they're temporal. They're not going to last very long. But the things that you can't see, they're eternal. They're going to last forever and forever and forever. Yes. And that's part of this part right here, too, that, that you see these, these men. You, you don't walk by what you can see. You, you can't, can't do that. You've got to walk by what you cannot see and put your faith and trust and confidence in that. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 through 13 I've got to read that right quick while somebody's turning there and getting that when God puts us through these trials remember he's trying to build our faith he's trying to help us to get where he wants us to be which is more like Christ that's where he wants you to be he wants you to be more like Christ and what we saw from these this rich man and this poor man, the trials they're going through, their social status didn't matter. What mattered was, where are you at spiritually? Where are you spiritually standing? Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Don't everybody volunteer at one time now. Spread it out. <laughs> okay, who's got it? All right, Eckert's back on. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. For I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Yeah, so here he goes. He says, I know how to be hungry. I've been there. He says, I know how, I've been there. I've been hungry. But I also know how to have plenty to eat. I know how to have no money. But I also know how to have money and to deal with that. In whatever state he's in, he says, I've learned to be content. Apparently, that's not something that's automatic because he says, I learned to be content. You have to learn that. You've got to put that in your mind and stick it in your mind and, and let it you know, grow there, <laughs> so to speak, because it's not something that you automatically do. But he learned to, to do that. we got to learn how to focus our mind. And when I say this, and when I'm up here teaching this class, I'm not saying this because I, I'm perfect at that, and I know how, how to do that really good. What I do know is that's what it says, and that's what we want to work toward. So if we're not there, we want to work toward our focus being on things that we can't see and that don't ever get destroyed off of it. So, how, how much? I'm, I'm about done, ain't I? Uh, wanted to get to this other part, but there it is. We'll get to verse 12 
next week. I got to pick. I I keep saying this, but I have got to pick this up. Are we gone in 2025? We'll be through the Book of James. 